So here we are. It's our sixth and final sermon on the Lord's Prayer. We began with, I think, one of the most important parts of this prayer, where Jesus teaches us to refer to God as our Father. Again, I I feel like it's so important to call that out because what Jesus was doing in that moment was to bring about a sense of intimacy with God. Whether you refer to God as your father or mother, the idea is that God is like an intimate, your creator, like your parent, but a very positive parent. (laughs) So if you didn't have a great experience with your earthly parents, this experience is an opportunity for you to have a wonderful experience with your heavenly parent. We talked about thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, our opportunity to right now in this time, not waiting for this idea of some afterlife salvation, but right now in this time to bring heaven on earth. What will that look like? What is our part in that? And then Dean took us through, give us this day our daily bread. What does that look like for us? And Greg last week, if you remember, if you were here, used a balloon. I thought that was a great visual to talk about forgiving our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Probably one of the more challenging pieces of the Lord's Prayer. But today we move into and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So as we've been thinking about these words and moving this prayer line by line by line over the last several weeks, have you thought about this? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you think God leads us into temptation? The reality is in Greek, The word is the same word for testing and tempting. The same word is used at different times in scripture and at different times it's used as one or the other, testing or tempting. I mean, when we think about the idea of God leading us into temptation, I think of Psalm 23, right? We know our our shepherd who leads us in the paths of righteousness. We look to James in chapter 1 where It is said, let no one who is tempted say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and God tempts no one. No, God isn't tempting us. We're not begging for God not to tempt us. This verse tells us of God's character and God's inability to tempt us with evil, and this is not because of what God doesn't do, but it's because of who our God is. In the book that we've been using for this sermon series called Prayers of the Cosmos, again by Neil Douglas Klotz, and I want to again um, thank so much to thank Noreen Owens for for bringing this book to our attention and and giving us the seeds for the series because it's just been so wonderful. But in his book, Klotz writes, these are probably the least understood and most mistranslated lines in this Lord's Prayer. So when we talk about lead us not into temptation, some suggestions he provides to us is maybe using don't let us enter into temptation or don't let us be seduced by the appearance of or don't let us heap up what's false or illusionary in. Temptation in the Aramaic sense is more like something that leads to inner uncertainty or agitation, for example, diverting us from the true purpose of our lives. This part of the Lord's Prayer has caused so much confusion over the years, and I don't know if you remember this, but back in May of 2019, Pope Francis approved a changing of the Lord's Prayer. Does anyone remember that? Um, He changed it because he was so um, concerned about this, and he said, uh, you know, He's changed it to, do not let us fall into temptation, which is more accurate maybe with what what the meaning was. And the Pope said, I'm the one who falls. It's not God pushing me into temptation to then see maybe how I'm going to do or how I've fallen. A father doesn't do that. A father keeps, excuse me, a father helps you. And that father helps you to get up immediately. But what do you guys think about that? 
Do you agree with Pope Francis? Changing the words of the Lord's Prayer? He seems to be saying what we already read this morning in James that I just shared with you, that temptation is not something that comes from God. But I can see why maybe the Pope felt a need for this change. Because if we're honest with ourselves and if we're honest with one another, many of us either can't or don't take time to figure out what Scripture really means. Sometimes we find it easier to read Scripture literally, and that doesn't usually end well for us, right? It kind of goes in one of a couple of ways. Either we read it literally and eventually reject all of it because it doesn't really make sense when it's read that way. Or, conversely, we accept Scripture literally. We never quite understand that, but we try to live in this box of accepting Scripture literally in the box of faith that it creates for us, layer of layer of rules and things that maybe don't always make so much sense, and we find it hard, but yet we hold on to it with certainty, and we hold on to it basically with fear because we're so afraid of being out of step with God. And being out of step with God, man, yeah, I get it. I don't want to be out of step with God. I, really, I don't. But I don't think the answer is reading Scripture literally either. The answer is more so doing some work, using these brains that God has given us to think, to understand, to listen wholly. Surely, it's hard. But let us remember some significant truths of our faith and our humanity. God has created us with free will. <clears throat> we know that there's evil in this world. Faith in God does not erase that evil in this world or the potential that any one of us at any time will experience great pain, great suffering, even with great faith we can and likely will experience great pain and great suffering. We know that God doesn't tempt us, as again we just read in James, that's not God's way. We know that hurting doesn't make us more spiritual, we aren't really meant to be martyrs. And we know from Galatians that all that comes from the Spirit is good. We know the fruits of the Spirit, as told in Galatians, are love and peace and joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. These are the things from God, my friends, not temptation. So when we really pray this prayer, what we're really doing is admitting that we're, we're weak, that we can and sometimes do fall towards temptation. And this prayer is asking for God's help with all of it. Help us avoid it. Help us move closer to you, dear God. We ask God to go further and to deliver us from evil. Said a different way, God, please help us to be more than the very worst part of ourselves. Our petition moves on to ask for deliverance from evil the evil within ourselves, and to save us from the evil that others do to us or the evil that is in the world around us. Makes me wonder, and, and I'm sure you wonder too sometimes, why is there such evil in the world? Why is it that if we're really honest with ourselves that we have tendency towards it ourselves as well? Now there's varying degrees of evil, right? But if we're truthful, I mean, it's through humanity that evil continues, right? It's through ourselves and our neighbors. Why do we hurt one another? Why is that our tendency? And, and how, how do we stop? Sometimes, now, I think this is more complicated, but some things to think about, to go down that line, to ask yourself, how do I stop? Maybe our transgressions aren't significant evil that's evil in the world, but 
Maybe it's our negative self-talk every single day that tells us we're not enough. Maybe it's that one last sip of that bottle of wine that's supposed to help me feel better and it's going to make me feel better and yet it doesn't. How do we stop? Oftentimes I think it takes the ability to stop and think. To use these amazing brains that God has given us to literally stop and think. We have but to turn on the TV and see the unpleasantness of our world and downright evil things that people do to one another. It could be in the news, right, or the significant current events of our day, but the reality, it's also in movies, sitcoms, the best-selling novels. We, it's like we romanticize it. We make it sexy. We make it exciting, these evil, horrible stories, and what we're really doing is like we're chewing on it. I guess I have to be honest, I hadn't thought about it that way until really thinking about this part of this prayer. I mean, I love superhero movies. There's always an evil villain. Now, always good conquers evil. But still, it always has that part, right? There's always that part of the story that I, like everyone else, is hungry for. I love seeing those stories. I love superhero movies. I can't wait for the next one to come out. And I think to myself, yeah, what am I doing? Really? I'm kind of chewing on some of that. It's hard to avoid because it's everywhere. Why is it? Why is it that we do these hurtful things sometimes to ourselves and to others? Why is it that it interests us such that we seek to watch it, experience it, when in truth, we are capable of great, tremendous, amazing things, regardless of what you tell yourself every day. You are capable of way more than you know, simply because you are God's beloved child. We're capable of way more. But yet, we fall towards the temptation. Evil, hurt, hardship. The list goes on and on and on. And we live out our failures. Sometimes we're so overcome with shame, we can't face it. Right? I'm going to drink again. I'm just going to do it tonight. Tonight is my last night. This is my last bottle of wine. No problem. I've got this all under control. Tonight is the last night Amen. And we're going to talk about amen. (laughs) But then I wake up in the morning, so filled with shame, I can't face myself. I can't face myself, let alone the idea of why am I doing this. I can't even look in the mirror. I'm such a rotten, miserable person. So what happens? Instead of moving towards, you know, all of the self-help and programs for recovery and programs for realization and to become better human beings, what do they say? The first thing is admission. I'm drinking too much. I'm not loving my neighbor. I'm saying horrible things to myself. Procrastinating. I'm prolificating all those stereotypes and bias about other people. Until we can do that, until we can move from the shame and say, yeah, that's me, I'm doing it. It's hard to start the correction process. The first part comes with admitting that there's a problem and admitting that we need help. We need to stop and think. We need to be able to look in the mirror and not only see ourselves as God's beloved, but know that God is with us. And that admission, and that admission of what is tempting us, of what is leading us towards evil instead of what's leading us towards beauty and love and grace and all of those wonderful things that are part of our faith, we're tempted. 
Why? Why is it? To admit first is to say, yeah, I have these problems, is the first step. And the second step is to start thinking, why? What is it? Why am I drinking too much? Why am I hurting myself? Why am I hurting my friends? What am I afraid of? What are my hidden biases? How does my own anger and fear and insecurity and aggression lead me down this path? If we find ourselves more often than we'd like to admit in a self-induced fog to avoid the pain, we need to ask ourselves, what pain are we avoiding? And let me be clear, we do this in a lot of ways. I'll be honest and tell you how I avoid my pain. I work more. I keep myself so stinking busy that I'm too busy to feel a thing. And you know, you can know the end of that story, right? You can only stay busy for so long. Eventually, you gotta slow down. And I've experienced anyway, I don't know if any of you are with me on this. You're all sitting very still and stone-faced. Maybe I'm the only one here with problems, just saying. I'll take it. But eventually, when you slow down, that stinking pain I've been avoiding for all that time by keeping myself wicked busy, or maybe you've been eating too much or drinking too much or whatever, you put your own thing in there. It's still there. Gosh darn it. I can't get away from that thing until I look it in the eye and confront it. That's really the only way out. And man, we all so much want a way out, don't we? I don't know about you, but I have a very low tolerance for pain. And I flaunt it. You know, some people, you know, they go into the doctor's office like, oh yeah, I don't need the anesthetic or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 I need it all. Give it to me. I don't have pain well. I don't want to feel anything that hurts. You know, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm really not. I am afraid of it hurting when I die. <laughs> I have to be really honest, right? So, admitting to ourselves that there's something that's getting in our way of our full, truth, beautiful selves, spending time even though it hurts, to look at what hurts and why. So we're on our way, and God is with us every single step of the way. Maybe, just maybe, we can start finding solutions when we start identifying problems. I feel like, in a way, guys, this whole Lord's Prayer, this Lord's Prayer is such a gift to us. If nothing came out of these six weeks for you other than to slow that prayer down and think about what you're saying, think about what you're asking for, and realize what our God can do for us, if nothing more comes out of it, then maybe that would be enough. In so many ways, everything about this is talking to us about strengthening our inner selves. Strengthening our inner lives of faith so that we can become thoughtful instead of habitual creatures. Thoughtful instead of habitual. Slow it down. Ask yourself why you do what you do, especially if it hurts. We have a chance maybe in those moments, to also see the consequences of our actions. See the consequences of the decisions we make before we jump right in. That's another thing. And if you've known me a while, and I know some of you here have known me a long while, I can sometimes be impulsive, just a little bit. I always joke and say I've married to the most least impulsive person, and it's perfect because Jim like anchors me. I could run it straight off a cliff, but he'll say, wait, you sure we should do that? God has been good to me through my husband. But truly, 
I like action. I like moving along. I like going. So I might just go jumping right in because, yes, that sounds great. Let's just try it out. You got to balance that, right? Stop, think, and look. And yeah, it could still be the best idea you've ever had and you should go for it. Or maybe you realize that what you're doing isn't really coming from a place of love, security, compassion, peace, joy. Maybe it's coming from resentment. Passive aggressive behavior. I could probably preach on that for a month. You know, those types of things. We have the ability to do this, guys. That's the thing. What I've learned, I'll save you like all the thousands of dollars of going to seminary. God doesn't ask us to do what we can't do. We can do this. It's all within our ability to develop the skills to live into our whole selves, our whole of who we are. I promise you that. But it is hard work. And let's face it, we don't always like the hard work. But it is our opportunity. And this, my friends, is my prayer for you and me. That we have the opportunity to avoid the worst part of ourselves. That we have the opportunity to be our best selves. And I tell you that God has promised to help us. And that's the beginning of the process, right? When we pray that Jesus, when we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let these words also be a commitment to do good and joyful work. That good and joyful, albeit sometimes hard, risky, scary, slightly painful, but good work at becoming our best selves. May it be so for all of us, for you and for me. Amen.